Good morning. We will go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for Black Maternal Health Advocacy Day during Black Maternal Health Week 21, a week recognized by Black the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. My name is Frankie Robertson, and I am the founder and president of the Amandla Group. And I'm so happy that you have taken time out of your busy schedules today to join leading Black maternal health experts to talk about the state of Black maternal health in Louisiana and how you can get engaged and involved to help improve birth outcomes for Black moms and Black birthing people. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we are doing um, today, and we'll go ahead and advance the slides. We are going to hear from uh, several advocates this morning representing various organizations that are doing great work here in Louisiana. Um, I am so honored to be a part of this work um, through my consulting firm, the Amanla Group. It is a social justice consulting firm focused on addressing the social and political determinants of health through policy, education, advocacy, and research that impacts black and brown birthing people. I um, am a maternal child health expert. I've worked in the field for over a decade. I'm also a mom of a preemie uh, daughter born at 28 weeks. So I'm very passionate about this work and very much so connected to the mission. And it is an absolute honor for me to represent several clients here today, uh, one of which is March of Dimes and one also National Birth Equity Collaborative and Moms of Black Boys United, as well as various partners who've assembled with these organizations to bring this day um, forward and make this possible and lift up the voices of Black and Brown birthing people during Black Maternal Health Week. So I'm so excited that you will be joining us today. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, what this day is all about and tell you a little bit more about Black Maternal Health Week. And after that, we'll meet the advocates and we'll share a lot of exciting information as well as um, ways that you can engage to impact um, policy in our state that will improve the health and birth outcomes for black and brown birthing people and our infants and children. So let's talk a little bit about what today is and what brings us here and talk a little bit about Black Maternal Health Week. So next slide. So Black Maternal Health Week was founded by Black Mamas Matter Alliance, and it's a media campaign promoting Black mamas claiming our right to live and to thrive. Every week, the week is um, recognized through April 11th through the 21st, and it is a national week, a national um, week of activities and that creates a safe space to center the voices and experiences of black mamas. And it's the battle for changing the state of black maternal health in the United States. And we are so excited to be a part of a coalition of black maternal health um, experts and organizations to be that voice, to be the lead in centering the vo voices, <coughs> excuse me, of black and brown birthing people throughout this week, but every day in our state to make sure that we are on the front lines to address maternal health outcomes. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Kylie Mayfield, who will introduce the various event hosts that are making this event possible today. Kylie. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Kylie Mayfield, birth equity analyst of the National Birth Equity Collaborative. And our mission is to optimize black maternal and infant health through training, policy advocacy, research and community centered collaboration. And I will introduce the other partners um, for this event. You can advance the slide. So we have Victoria Williams, who is a um, licensed medical social worker, um, certified breastfeeding specialist and a doula in Ashley Hill Hamilton. Director of Advocacy and Research for the New Orleans Breastfeeding Center, as well as Birthmark Doula Collective. And um, birth, the New Orleans Breastfeeding Center is, a, is passionate about breastfeeding and fulfilling needs of the communities they serve. And Birthmark Doula Collective is a birth justice organization dedicated to supporting, informing, and advocating for pregnant and parenting people and their families in New Orleans. We have Michonne Tauver, who is an MPH. Um, 
and she is the Senior Program Manager for Maternal and Child Health. And um, she works for the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies. And IWES is dedicated to improving the mental, physical, and spiritual health and quality of life for women, their families, and communities of color. And we have Renee Antoine, who is the Director of Maternal and Infant Health and Government Affairs at March of Dimes. And March of Dimes leads the fight for health of all moms and babies nationally and on the state level. We have Nicole Deggins, who is a certified nurse midwife, and she is the creator of Sister Midwife's Production. And Sister Midwife Productions is a birth advocacy organization based in New Orleans, and they provide education, training, and consultations for communities, birth workers, and organizations that work with, that work with childbearing families. We also have Divine Bailey Nicholas, and she is a certified lactation consultant, doula, and midwife apprentice. She's the founder and CEO of Community Birth Companion, which is an infant and maternal mortality prevention nonprofit organization whose, mention, whose mission is to decrease infant and maternal mortality rates among low-income mothers through childbirth education, breastfeeding promotion, and community doulas and opelousas. And we also have Depelsha Thomas McGruder, who is the founder and president of Moms of Black Boys United. And Moms of Black Boys United is a social change, is a organization that's dedicated to positively influencing how Black boys and men are perceived and treated by law enforcement and in society. And we have Carrie Monks, who's the founder and president of the Premium Mom Coach. And the Premium Mom Coach inspires and offers supports to families affected by premature birth um, by coaching them through their neonatal intensive care unit journey and after discharge. And we have Kimberly Novod, who's the founder and president of Saul's Light, which is a New Orleans-based nonprofit that provides support and community to families with babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. And um, Governor John Bill Edwards, he has um, recognized April 11th through the 17th, um, 2021, Black Maternal Health Week. And I will just take a brief moment to read through the proclamation that he signed. Thank you, Governor Edwards. So the proclamation, whereas Louisiana has the highest maternal mortality rate in the nation, and whereas the high rates of maternal mortality among Black women span across income levels, education levels, and socioeconomic status, and whereas structural racism, gender oppression, and the social determinants of health contribute to high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity among Black women, and whereas even as there is concern about improving access to mental health services, Black women are least likely to have access to screenings, treatment and support and whereas it is important that black communities have access to adequate housing transportation equity nutritious food environments free from toxins fair treatment within the criminal justice system safety and freedom from violence equal economic opportunity and also quality respectful comprehensive and affordable health care and whereas we acknowledge April 11th through the 17th, 2021 as Black Maternal Health Week to bring attention to Louisiana's Black maternal health crisis and the importance of reducing maternal mortality and morbidity among Black women and birthing families. Now, therefore, I, John Bell Edwards, governor of the state of Louisiana, do hereby proclaim April 11th through the 17th, 2021 as Black Maternal Health Week in the state of Louisiana. Again, thank you, Governor Edwards. And now I will pass it over to Ashley Hill Hamilton. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. I want to send out a special thank you 
to our elected officials and their staff who have been working side by side with us to get some of these bills move forward, um, including Representative Matthew Willard, Stephanie Hilferty, Representative Royce Duplessis, Representative Landry, um, and Senator Regina Barrow. Those are just a few of the people and their staff members who have been working so diligently with us on the bills that we wish to move forward and that you'll learn more about today. Thank you to the rest of the elected officials who are on this call. We appreciate your support. Thank you so much. We could not do this work without you. Good morning. My name is Divine Bailey Nicholas and I'm representing Community Birth Companion. In the state of Louisiana, we have a crisis of black maternal and mortality and morbidity. For all pregnancy related deaths in the state of Louisiana, over 5.6 black women die for every white woman. The most common causes of these deaths are hemorrhage, cardiovascular disease, and cardiomyopathy. Over 45% of all pregnancy related deaths are preventable. Many of these deaths have occurred between 24 hours and 42 days after delivery. Black women in Louisiana are likely to experience pregnancy related death, often said before, more than their white women. And women over the age of 35 are more than three times more likely to experience pregnancy related death. One of our major issues that we have in the state is the inaccessibility of maternity care in our rural communities. We're living in maternity deserts with no accessibility to prenatal care. Women living in rural communities most oftentimes leave their community almost an hour outside of where they live and travel great distances to receive prenatal care, um, obstetrical and postpartum care. Almost half of Louisiana parishes do not have an OBGYN. And we also have a shortage, of, a shortage of accessibility to care from certified nurse midwives, certified professional midwives, and doulas in those areas. So let's re-examine some of the social determinants of health. Many times when we think of social determinants of health, we're thinking about and talking about um, socioeconomic status. But what we have found out is that of women, um, African American women who are highly educated in these country, in this in this country, in the U.S. and in the state, still have five times, still are five times more likely to have a pregnancy-related death than their white counterparts. So we're seeing here that social economic status is not just a key issue as far as um, these high um, mortal mortality and morbidity rates amongst black women in the state of Louisiana. So when we're talking about social, um, social determinants of health, we're talking about racial and gender inequalities. We're talking about food deserts. It's also connected to our maternity deserts and the areas that we live, employment, income, housing, these things are affecting us, chronic disease, environmental issues of where we're living here in the state of Louisiana. And also we cannot dismiss um, many of the physical and mental stresses of living in the state and in the country where our people are consistently oppressed and dealing with racism and white supremacy and what that does to the psyche of the woman while pregnant. We are living in a current crisis of maternal and mortal mortality and morbidity in the state of Louisiana, and it is totally unaccessible, unacceptable. And now I'm giving it to Kylie and Victoria. And everyone, so I'll just take time to, me and Victoria, we will speak on the mama health policy agenda that we have been working on with some of our partners um, to create solutions to the Black maternal health crisis that's in Louisiana. <clears throat> so the mama health policy agenda, or is also known as the New Orleans Mommy Bus, and is a, is a policy focused initiative aimed at addressing the maternal health emergency and closing maternal health gaps 
for Black birthing people in New Orleans. It's loosely structured after the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2021, which was a federal legislative package created to address the national Black maternal health crisis. The Mama Health the Mama Plus health policy agenda will comprise both the local and state level policies and recommendations from the state led initiatives such as the mortality review committees are uplifted in the titles on the policy agenda. And now I'll just pass it over to Victoria to go over some of the titles. Good morning. Yes, some of the titles um, which are listed here will focus, we have, sorry, eight titles um, aimed at uh, in this policy initiative that will address and mostly impact uh, the health and the birth outcomes of Black birth and people in New Orleans. Some of the titles that are listed here are social determinants of health, um, addressing uh, increasing the perinatal, perinatal workforce, uh, extending Medicaid for postpartum, supporting incarcerated birth and people, uh, maternal health, maternal mental health and substance abuse, uh, disorder treatment, telehealth uh, for underserved areas and grouped uh, prenatal care. So all of these policies also impact uh, the criminal justice reform and economic um, economic justice in the state of Louisiana. So the great thing about the policies, is like Kylie said, they're not just statewide, uh, they're not just local, they're also statewide. So these have the potential to affect a great amount of people. Um, and we're so excited to have together a working group of organizations who come together monthly to discuss these titles and really dive in and, and dig deep into what we can do to impact the state of Louisiana. Um, thank you so much. And we'll turn it over to Kylie and Representative Duplessis. Hi, uh, so I'll just um, cover two of the bills that we are supporting. And these bills primarily deal with things that aren't directly affected to health care, um, connected to health care. So I'll be covering House Bill 374, which is the eviction record bill, which is sponsored by Representative Royce Duplessis. And this bill, it allows renting families to offer context about pandemic related evictions. It improves accuracy for renters and landlords, and it ensures disclosure of screening criteria. And also House Bill 7, which is known as the Pink Tax, which is sponsored by Representative Amy Adato Freeman. And House Bill 7 creates a statewide sales tax exemption on both menstrual products and children in adult diapers and it lessens the financial burden primarily for birthing people and families. And I will say that both of those bills, they will positively impact Black maternal health because they will help lessen the stress that, you know, the birthing people are carrying um, and the stress for Black birthing families. Um, research has shown that housing um, in instability in housing insecurity, it greatly impacts Black maternal health and um, birth outcomes. So if we're able to, can you go back to the back, um, last slide, please? Thank you. Um, so if we're able to address the eviction record bill, which will um, ensure disclosure of screening criteria and improve accuracy, that will improve um, access to renting and lessen that burden, as well as House Bill 7 will lessen the, burden, the financial burden for those birthing families who may be low income um, and have to pay for, you know, um, adult and children diapers and also um, menstrual um, um, pads and feminine hygiene products. And now I will pass it over to I will pass it on to um, Kimberly Novod from Saul's Light. Thank you, Kylie. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to talk with you about HB 146, um, which is carried by Representative Stephanie Hilperty. HB 146 provides families who experience a stillbirth with a tax credit for up to $2,000. Now, 
It recognizes and acknowledges those babies' lives that were taken too soon from the earth and from their families' um, existence and love, their dreams, and everything that they imagined that their lives would be like with that baby. Um, this tax benefit addresses the financial, emotional, and cultural barriers and hardships that family face when they experience the stillbirth of a child. This tax credit will allow Louisiana families to access mental health services, pay for burial costs and funeral costs, and also may provide assistance to address a litany of medical bills that families experience once they deliver a stillbirth. Many people don't know this, but costs associated with stillborn babies are about $2,000 more than the cost of the birth of a live baby. In addition, there are costs associated with finding out why your baby was born still. So that can be thousands of dollars for blood tests, for genetic testing, also many health insurance and life insurance companies do not insure the life of a child before it is born. So that doesn't matter if a baby is 20 weeks or 41 weeks. This is a refundable tax credit and instead of an exemption. That means that the lowest income families, those who do not otherwise benefit from taxes would not benefit from an exemption. That's why it's important for us that it is a tax credit so that all families in Louisiana will still be able to claim this tax benefit if their child is still born. It's very important to talk about the impact of stillbirth during Black Maternal Health Week, as we know that uh, Black women and Black babies are two to three times more likely to be born premature and also stillborn, leading to Louisiana's high rate of infant mortality. Today, I call on legislators and all of Louisiana to support this bill. We need you to make a difference in the lives of Louisiana babies and families. This is nonpartisan. There is nothing like carrying your child for 30 weeks, 40 weeks, and then being told that there's no heartbeat. We implore you to make a difference in the lives of families. Let them know that their child matters. Let them know that when they experience the burden and hardship that is faced with infant mortality, that they are not alone that it is okay to avail yourself of mental health services and that we're going to support you in being able to do that. Letting them know that it's okay to have a dignified burial for your baby. This is again, a nonpartisan issue because infant mortality and stillborn babies are not red or blue, but they certainly leave a space in the hearts of their families that love them. Thank you. Well, I'll take it from here. We'll talk about HB 495. I'm Michonne with the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies. And this bill is sponsored by Representative uh, Barry Ivey. This uh, HB 495 reveals, uh, repeals the CPA requirement, collective practice requirement um, that is uh, placed upon advanced practice nurse practitioners, uh, advanced practice uh, registered nurses, and certified nurse midwives. This bill, um, our colleagues at the Louisiana Nurse Practitioner Association have been working on this bill for uh, a while with representative. And this bill um, and set the has been set in over 20 states. We really uh, support this bill because it relieves our partners, our colleagues of an undue burden, both financial, financially, because there's a, a financial hardship that is placed on nurse practitioners and nurse midwives. And also it decreases access to care for our families who really um, need access to care, our low income families. This is something that um, Divine mentioned earlier. So this, uh, relieving, repealing this requirement will actually increase access to all of those parishes in our state that definitely need the help of nurse practitioners. 
It also will attract more qualified individuals to our state and also nurses that are looking to advance their careers by getting more training. So we um, ask that you support this bill. I'm very happy and, in, and stand with our colleagues as they work to provide safe care to our families in the state of Louisiana. And I'm gonna pass this on to Renee to continue us on. Good morning, everyone. Today I will be discussing House Bill 468, the extension of postpartum Medicaid coverage to one year um, for all persons after pregnancy. In the hours, days, and weeks after childbirth, women should be bonding with their newborns and watching them thrive and grow. Yet, the United States is still one of the most dangerous places to give birth, despite our world-class health system and our per capita spending on healthcare. 700 women die in the United States each year from causes related to pregnancy, and around 50,000 suffer from severe complications like heart attack, kidney failure, and shock that can impact their health and even disable them for months. One in five women are affected by anxiety, depression, and other maternal mental health conditions during and after the first year of pregnancy. These stats are even more increasingly disparate among Black and American Indian populations. We can prevent most pregnancy-related deaths by ensuring women have continuous access to care before, during, and after pregnancy. Yet too many of our most vulnerable moms spend most of the first year after childbirth when they are still at risk of complications and even death with no health coverage or unstable health care coverage. An important first step towards ending the maternal health crisis is passing legislation that permanently extends Medicaid coverage through the first year after a woman welcomes her child into the world. And on the call with us today, we have Representative Landry Landry, who's going to speak on her bill um, for CCH for this important topic. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Um, I'm Rep. Mandy Landry from New Orleans, and I am rushing around to get to the Capitol for my first meeting this morning. I appreciate you inviting me. Um, HB 468 is a great bill and it's probably uh, my favorite bill out of all the bills I filed and the one I wanna pass the most. Um, I got the idea for this to extend postpartum Medicaid coverage because it's happening in a lot of states around the country. And I think I literally just saw an article on it and thought, why is uh, postpartum coverage, why does it end at 60 days? That's ridiculous. We know in our state, I mean, I don't have to tell this group, I'm sure you think about it every day, the uh, negative birth outcomes for so many uh, black and brown women in the state and, and poor women. So uh, I looked into it. I have several calls this week. Medicaid is very complicated as, as I'm finding out. And uh, I know a lot more about it than I did a few weeks ago, um, but there's a way to do this and we just got to get the numbers right. And, uh, and I think it's very doable and it fits with a lot of the rest of uh, what y'all are looking at. So I hope we can do this. Um, I hope we can get it done permanently. Uh, but in any event, there's a lot of federal money coming in that would apply to this. And so I'm hoping uh, that's what we can do. Um, I'm always able to answer any questions. I have a couple of other somewhat related bills that I think um, Frankie wanted me to mention. I don't know if she, if she wants to message me if now is the time, um, I'll just go ahead. Sorry, real quick, because they're related to what y'all already talked about. So, um, yes, okay. Um, I heard about the uh, stillbirth credit bill and I thought that was a really interesting idea. Um, I wonder if we have the same for maternal deaths and it turns out we don't in the state. So I have um, two pieces of legislation and the reason why is is because I kind of ran out of time looking for funding for one, but uh, one is a similar to the, the stillborn credit um, that would apply to pregnancy related deaths. And I'm working with LDH and Ostner to make sure we get that definition right. And it would also be a refundable tax credit, but in speaking with some advocates, as you know, and we discovered, not everyone's probably gonna be able to access that benefit. So what I'm trying to create, and, and the reason I said I ran out of time is I haven't been able to find funding yet, but I'm working on it, um, is a burial fund. And it's similar to right now, um, FEMA is doing for COVID deaths, a, a 
funeral benefits fund, and it covers a list of items for people who passed away from COVID. Um, and this fund would be similar for maternal deaths. I think we can get it created. Funding is gonna be a little bit of a bigger issue, um, but I'm working on that with, with several other members. And I think it's something that's very doable, doable and it also can be privately funded. So those are um, a few ideas I have. I wanted to do something on the, the front end, which you know prevent deaths through further access to healthcare. But then in the event that tragedy happens, we have something in place. So um, I'm excited to meet all of you and hope to see you soon at the Capitol. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I will go over Senate Bill 215, the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, sponsored by Senator Regina Barrow. This provides for the reasonable accommodations of pregnant and postpartum workers. Rising numbers of women are remaining in the workplace during pregnancy and working later into their pregnancies than ever before. Half of all women work during pregnancy and go back to work after their baby is born. Some women may need to take precautions on the job in order to protect the health of their pregnancy and their future child. Reasonable accommodations for pregnancy, childbirth, or pregnancy-related condition enable pregnant women and new mothers to stay at work, maintain both their physical health and their financial stability, and can increase the number of babies born healthy, on time, and without different birth defects. This particular legislation will make that happen. Pregnancy dis discrimination could be avoided with reasonable accommodations. A change in policy would ensure that reasonable accommodations are provided for pregnant workers who are limited in their ability to perform their jobs due to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions associated with it. The law is designed to ensure that these accommodations would not impose an undue hardship on the employer. Ex examples might include providing an employee with extra bathroom breaks, assisting with heavy lifting, or a light duty assignment. Such accommodations would afford pregnant women and new mothers the ability to continue working, protecting both their physical and their financial stability. So we strongly support Senate Bill 215, the Pregnant Women's Fairness Act, sponsored by Senator Regina Barrow. Thank you. Next, I'll discuss SB 72, Office on Women's Health, that's being sponsored by Senator Troy Carter. This bill creates the Office on Women's Health within the Louisiana Department of Health. We thank our partners at the Louisiana um, Center for Health Equity, led by Ms. Almo Stewart, who have been working uh, on this as well. This particular bill will help that uh, to establish the office, and the office would have concentrated efforts resources and policy uh, to improve health outcomes and eliminate those disparities unique to women, especially as we talk about Black Maternal Health Week, reducing the maternal deaths, um, improving our infant outcomes and, and improving our overall birth outcomes. So this office is very important as we work to improve the lives of the uh, birthing people in our city. So I am going to turn it over to, I believe, Frankie, um, or are we going to talk about the doula bill next? Yes, we're actually going to talk about the doula bill and we're going to leave it on this slide and you and Victoria can go ahead and cover um, HB 190. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ashley Hill Hamilton um, from Birthmark Doula Collective in the New Orleans Breastfeeding Center. I'm here with Victoria Williams, who is also with Birthmark Doula Collective and the New Orleans Breastfeeding Center. Um, House Bill 190, House, I'm sorry, House Bill, House Bill 190 was written by Representative um, Matthew Willard, <clears throat> which requires health insurance cover for maternity services provided by certified nurse midwives, certified professional midwives and doulas. The bill would ensure that doulas and midwife costs are treated like any other cost of childbirth and are reimbursed by clients insurers without discrimination. It's essential that doulas and midwives are a part of this um, as Louisiana currently ranks as a state with one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the United States. 
um, and has an obligation to promote practices that improve maternal health outcomes. House Bill 190 is crucial for um, the elevation of doulas and midwives in the in the city of New Orleans, oh, really across the state. Uh, we're excited to support. We're excited about the support from Senator Willard, um, and we we're actually looking forward to everyone supporting this bill once it is um, in play. Um, what I do like is that he's been on the ground, getting feedback from um, fellow doulas and midwives here in the state. Um, and we, we thank him for the, represent, the representation and support that he's given to this issue. And Victoria and Ashley, thank you so much. Representative Willard is on the call this morning. So we certainly will invite him to say a few words about his legislation that he has uh, just been so gracious to allow uh, many of us on the call uh, to contribute to this really necessary piece of legislation. And we are um, communicating in the chat, but I think Representative Willard may be having some challenges unmuting. So we'll keep moving. And once we get that issue resolved, we will graciously extend an opportunity for Representative Willard uh, to speak. So just hold on, Representative Willard. <laughs> and thank you for being here. Now I would like to take a moment uh, to introduce a um, one of many very special guests this morning, a dear friend, Dr. Shanae Morrison Nelson. Dr. Uh, Nelson will share with us the urgency of now. Um, she is a two-time survivor of preeclampsia, a fierce advocate for maternal health and Black maternal health. And I'm so happy and honored that she has joined us this morning to share her personal testimony um, of her, her birth of her two beautiful daughters and her, her challenges and triumphs along the way. Dr. Nelson, thank you so much for joining and thank you for your openness and your willingness to share um, your, your very deeply personal experience on behalf of you, uh, on behalf of your husband, TJ, and your family. Thank you. Oh, absolutely, Frankie. Thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of today. I'm really excited to be a part of this effort, and I know it's been a long time coming. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be an advocate in this space with so many of you who I've had the privilege of working with previously in a number of efforts, and to see it come together in this way is um, it brings complete joy to my heart. So thank you for inviting me today. Um, as Frankie said, I am a two-time preeclampsia survivor. Um, I am the uh, mother of two beautiful daughters, both born prematurely, Mary Grace and Emery. Uh, Mary Grace was born at 32 weeks uh, and Emery was born at 26 weeks. Um, so when I was diagnosed with preeclampsia, um, I was 32 years old when I became pregnant with Mary Grace. Um, that was six, almost seven years ago now. And I, I was not familiar with preeclampsia. I did not have a history of hypertension or high blood pressure. I was in uh, picture perfect health at the time. Um, and of course, I kept up with my doctor's appointments and uh, was very particular about uh, my practices in terms of the fact that it was my first pregnancy. I wanted to make sure that I did everything right. And so I did that. Um, so I remember going to, I think it was my 30 week um, appointment um, to see my OBGYN. And at the time I was very swollen. My legs were swollen. I wasn't really feeling well. And of course, it was very noticeable. And so I brought it up to uh, my OBGYN. I was like, you know, something's just not right. I'm not quite sure if this is normal or these normal pregnancy symptoms. Again, it's my first pregnancy. I mean, you know, I really wasn't sure. And she was like, well, your blood pressure is slightly elevated. Um, and yeah, you're, you're swollen and, you know, you, you may just not be feeling well. Could be attributed to normal pregnancy symptoms. So I didn't really worry about it much. She did say if I noticed the symptoms getting any worse to let her know. Um, two weeks later, 
uh, went for my normal appointment and um, my blood pressure was stroke level. Um, it was, I didn't, and the scary thing about it is I didn't feel any symptoms. I felt fine, um, but I was not fine. I was very sick uh, and my baby was as well. So to make a long story short, I was immediately um, transported to the hospital that was an hour away that had a NICU who could take care of my baby because the baby would have to be delivered um, by emergency C-section. Um, so she was, and uh, luckily, again, I was at 32 weeks. She was, uh, she had a one month NICU stay and, and did very well. And you look at her now, she hasn't missed a beat. <laughs> Uh, she really is a tremendous blessing. For me, though, uh, I have now, since then, struggled with blood pressure issues and hypertension, um, including anxiety. Um, since then, I have been on medication for blood pressure issues um, and various treatments and also anxiety medication um, currently, which I did not have before. Um, so fast forward to um, four years later with my second daughter um, had preeclampsia diagnosis again. The difference this time was that I knew what the symptoms were. So I, I'd been there. I knew, I knew what they were. I knew what was happening. I remember calling um, my doctor's office to say, hey, I, I need to come in like right away. Something is wrong. Um, I believe preeclampsia is happening again, like it did four years ago. And I'll tell you, and I know I shared this story with some who are already on the, on the call, but I had a very um, negative experience with trying to make contact, uh, making an appointment um, at that time uh, with the nurse who answered the phone, who really just discounted my concern um, for what I was, I was telling her. So eventually I, I was able to make that appointment and sure enough, the same symptoms I had four years ago were now um, like four times worse. Uh, I was older and I was at 26 weeks as opposed to 32. So uh, Emery uh, was born 26 weeks, one pound, 12 ounces. She had a three month stay in NICU. She was immediately intubated, um, went through the entire um, progressive process um, for her respiratory uh, issues and her system and, and the development. But again, just like with Mary Grace, you look at Emery now, she hasn't missed a beat. Uh, you cannot tell that she's been through all that she has. And, um, you know, looking, looking back on that experience and the reason why I'm such a passionate advocate now is that there was uh, a missing link in terms of the education and awareness about the dangers that could happen with pregnancy. Um, it, it's a joyful time, it's exciting, but sometimes we don't really think about what could go wrong. And in a lot of cases in the um, medical space and having conversations about pregnancy with our medical providers, sometimes those conversations um, just don't take place at all or they're not happening enough. Um, which is why I've been a part of this effort uh, from the beginning uh, in wanting to ensure that, um, that moms are, are aware, that they are educated about uh, the dangers. And not only that, um, that, that people pay attention whenever they, they do express concern that is taken seriously. Um, now, as I hear about so many women, uh, black and brown women who are losing their lives to preeclampsia and so many other um, other health issues that it could that could have been prevented, uh, it breaks my heart. And I think it's because it's just a lack of awareness, a lack of really paying attention, and making it a priority um, in the medical space um, from all angles. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this conversation and a part of this effort. Uh, happy to be here at all to have uh, survived preeclampsia twice. Um, and although I do have the health, the health concerns that I, I have now, overall, I'm okay. I'm getting treated for it and everything is fine. Um, but I, I think about the, the fact that things could have easily gone uh, very wrong for myself and for uh, my children. 
Um, but I thank you again for having me here today. Again, if there's anything I can do, any more that I can do to support this effort, I'll be more than happy to be a part of it. So thank you again. And thank you all, especially the elected officials who are spearheading this effort in the legislature with these bills. Um, again, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. For my family, we appreciate you and we appreciate all that you're doing for moms like me who are survivors. So um, thank you and uh, thank you again for having me. Dr. Nelson, thank you so much. Thank you for, for sharing your experience, for just being so open and, and, and vulnerable to share in this space, um, in the spirit of advocacy and change and giving voice to moms who could not be here today or moms who are not here today because they were not in that fortunate group of moms such as you and I and others that survived to tell their story. So thank you. And I hope that you give yourself some space and permission to, to breathe after um, sharing such an emotional and traumatic um, experience um, with us today. So thank you. I will turn it over to Renee Antwine with March of Dimes to share uh, some information with us about the organi our organizations, various organizations uh, work around addressing maternal mental health. Renee? Thank you, Frankie. Maternal mental health is a growing concern for everyone in America. A mother's mental health is directly connected to her physical health and the health of her baby. Many women experience mental health challenges during pregnancy and the postpartum period, such as depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Acquisition is to strongly support efforts to improve screening, diagnosis, and treatment from women with maternal mental health disorders. Most mental health disorders can be treated once identified and diagnosed. A study shows that screening at least once during pregnancy can and increase treatment and diagnosis. We strongly identify five key elements that are critical to addressing and improving maternal mental health. Access, universal screening, education, referral and treatment, as well as surveillance. We are very excited to have a toolkit that encourages all of our advocates to log on to marchadimes.org and you can find out how to connect with your legislators around maternal mental health advocacy. Thank you, Renee. I appreciate you sharing um, this valuable information. March of Dimes has a really amazing um, maternal mental health toolkit. And if you go to marchofdimes.org um, and um, uh, type in advocacy or maternal mental health advocacy, you will find that toolkit, which is really helpful. And I'll actually drop it in the chat. But as many of you saw in the chat, <laughs> Sean said yes. Yes, this is real. You know, this is real life. And I'm so grateful for Renee for being on this call this morning and for navigating our precious baby, Austin. Um, many of us as moms throughout this pandemic, this is a real glimpse of life. So this couldn't come more perfect at a more perfect time where we have policymakers who are on the call today to see what we're navigating as moms. I'm literally um, tiptoeing around my two children right now who are who are still asleep and uh, getting through my, my webinar this morning as well. And many of us are off camera this morning as we're navigating our precious little ones who we are working to protect from this, this vicious virus. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for being moms. Thank you for being advocates. Thank you for being the strong black women that we are every day and making things happen, um, not only for ourselves and our families, but for society as a whole. So thank you, I'm right here with you and this will be me in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so thank you, Renee. Um, so Representative DePlessis um, was uh, on the call earlier. I know he is also uh, uh, in a legislative meeting and will soon be going to committee. So Representative DePlessis, let's see, let me look through the participant list and see if he is still here with us right now. I know a lot of legislators have to hop off um, because of committee meetings, um, which we know this is a, a busy time and they're always trying to be in like 20 places at one time. So the fact that they're showing up to be here for us and be so 
show their passionate support for these issues, we, we, we appreciate it from the depths of our souls. I see that Representative Plus is, is showing that he's still on the call. If you're able to speak um, and would like to say a few words, we certainly invite you, but we also know that we um, talked about multiple meetings happening this morning as well. Hey, uh, Frankie, or can you hear me? Can hear you just fine. Good morning. Oh, uh, good morning. Thank you for joining. Thank you. So Renee, um, as you witnessed, was trying to talk to us about maternal mental health, and she did a great, great job speaking of maternal mental health. And um, we just wanted to give you some space this morning to just, one, thank you so much for being a champion for maternal health and Black maternal health. Two, for um, just being that listening ear and champion, um, as many of us met with you for the past few months about our concerns about the state's dire need to address the state's mater lack of maternal mental health resources, especially as it relates to black and brown uh, women and birthing people of childbearing age. So we just wanted to invite you on to just say a few words about why this issue is passionate to you and just thank you for the work that you're doing with us to create the resolutions to begin the process of addressing the state's dire needs uh, to address this issue. Sorry, I guess I guess I was was I muted. You were, you were only for a I'm few so seconds. Sorry. So welcome. I'm, I'm sorry, and let me. I, I'm away from everybody now. I had to step out of the um, this tax policy meeting that we're having with the governor's staff to talk about what's happening on um, all this tax reform stuff. But anyhow, I just want to say thank you to all of you for just all of the incredible advocacy work that you've been doing. I see a lot of familiar names and faces on this call, and I'm just really inspired by the work that you all are doing to bring attention, and not just attention, but actual policy aimed at improving the lives and the quality of lives of our pregnant women, of uh, women who have uh, just delivered children, just, just delivered babies, and in the uh, unfortunate instances where mothers have, uh, have had uh, episodes of still stillborn children being born and I know uh, Saul's light is on here I, I do want to just take a moment to give a personal shout out to the great work that Kimberly uh, is doing with that and I'm excited to support that legislation that representative Hilferty is bringing this year but uh, outside of that I continue to just learn more about the dire needs that uh, women in Louisiana are faced with uh, the challenges that they're faced with and how we as a, as a lawmaking body have to respond and we have to uh, act now because the disparities are just so glaring in terms of uh, just the poor outcomes of our mothers. And as I become more and more educated about this and learn more about these uh, postpartum challenges, particularly on the issue around mental health and uh, depression that our women are faced with, uh, I'm really looking forward to working with Frankie and the other members of uh, this, this coalition to bring some instruments this session that are gonna work towards trying to develop policies around effective screening tools that we can implement to ensure that women are getting all the services that they need uh, after uh, delivering uh, their babies. And this is just something that we cannot neglect. This is something that we cannot put off. I'm certainly excited that the governor's office is stepping up. They're creating the office of uh, Women's, women's policy and women's health women, to focus on women's health, but we really have to double down and put some real resources and dollars um, and, and, and effective policies around curbing the poor outcomes around women's issues, particularly during and after uh, pregnancy. So again, this is still something that uh, I'm still learning more about every day, but I'm, I'm looking forward to remaining a partner with you all and standing with you all. I think that we are a much louder chorus when we sing together. Uh, it's not about one person versus the other. It's about all of, all of us standing together to promote women's health, to promote um, women, uh, particularly black women's health, but to all women's health. But we know that there's a great disparity as it, as it pertains to uh, black women throughout Louisiana and uh, dealing with pregnancy and, and postpartum uh, matters. So thank you all so much for the work that you're doing. I stand with you, I support you. And uh, let's continue 
doing all that we can to support women during and after pregnancy. Absolutely. Thank you, Representative Plessis, for showing up. Thank you for multitasking and thank you for fighting for fair tax policy. So um, we will certainly uh, thank you. Thank look you forward all. to working with and you. And I will be in touch with you all. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great day. Stay safe. All right. So now thank you all so at, much. We'll be in touch. Very welcome. So now we've come to the part of our program where we are going to take a few questions um, from the chat. So at this time, if there are any burning questions uh, for any of our um, event co-hosts, um, we can go ahead, you can go ahead and, and drop it in the chat and uh, we will direct that question to the appropriate co-host. So we'll give it a few minutes just to see if there are any questions. We'll count it down for about 30 seconds and see if there's some fast fingers typing fast and furiously before we conclude. All right, so we do have a question and it is from um, Tori Carrier and uh, Tori is asking, how can we stay up to date with all of these issues? Um, do I have uh, one of the co-hosts who would like to answer that question for us? How do we stay up to date with all of these issues? Hi, everyone. I can go ahead and speak. So um, for the Mama Health Policy Agenda, we have been working closely with the New Orleans Maternal Child Health Coalition, and they have a link that individuals interested in staying up to date um, and interested in um, being advocates for the issues. They have a new link that you can sign up at, and I will drop the link in the chat. And they'll be sending out emails through Action Network. All right, are there any other questions? Is anyone else typing any other question in the chat? All right, well, I will turn it back over to Renee uh, just for some closing items. And then Renee, I'm gonna ask you to bounce it back to me when you're done, because I, I may have a closing announcement. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for having some grace with me with my infant this morning. Um, so we just want to thank everyone for attending this morning. Our legislative staff, we could not do this without you, all of our host organizations, as well as our advocates on the call. We also want to let you know that we're really looking forward to uplifting these messages throughout all of our social media accounts. So starting today, specifically for our legislative partners, um, we're going to send you some information via email. Um, we would like you to start at noon, um, really uplifting the messaging around Black Maternal Health Week and the importance of pushing these messages forward to make sure um, that everyone knows what's going on in Louisiana and around our, our state, around our data, our stats, and just all these wonderful organizations who are really pushing for their missions to improve perinatal health outcomes for mothers of color in our state. To our advocates, we'll also send you some information on ways to contact your legislators to make sure they know that your voice wants to be heard, how to appropriately contact them, which bills and um, which you know staff you should be contacting and details of which bills we really want to push for and which ones we also want to shoot back on as well. So we thank you so much for your voice, for being a champion for all moms and babies in Louisiana and all the work that you do every single day, especially during this you know really tough time with COVID-19. Frankie? You are. So, hey, everybody. Yes, I am on the phone right now. I'm on the phone with our amazing Senator Regina Barrow, who is calling in, and we're chatting right here. And she could not be as a be on the webinar today. We know Senator Barrow is multitasking just like everyone else, and she, she's headed to various meetings, but she called in because she's always going to show up. So we appreciate her. And she has a special message that she was actually relaying for me to relay to everyone. And that is that she, and they're giving some messages in the chat to you. So Senator Barrow. So she wants everyone to know that um, she appreciates the hard work of everyone. She is happy uh, to author the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act. Um, she appreciates all of the support. 
um, we know that she's always been on the front lines um, to advocate for issues of moms and babies. And what else did you want me to let them know, Senator Barrow? <laughs> Oh, yes. We just talked about that. So Senator Barrow just wants to stress that we need um, everybody's advocacy. We need everybody all hands on deck. And she's reiterating her um, support for the development of the Office of Women's Health within the Office of uh, Louisiana Department of Health. So thank you so much, Senator Barrow. We will remain on the front lines and we appreciate you. No, thank you. And we appreciate you calling and we will, some of us will see you at the Capitol. Some of us will be watching you virtually, but know that we are with you, whether it's by letter of support or a viewing in committee, but we are there. So thank you so much. And thank you for calling, calling in to support us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. <laughs> All right. So this is like live TV or something, right? This is great. So Senator Barrow, um, you know, where there's a will, there's a way she called in and uh, ex ex uh, expressed her support. And I just wanted to, to make sure that we got her got her message um, relayed to the group. So we appreciate her championing um, Senate Bill 215. And we're looking forward to, to standing on the front lines as a coalition to support not only that bill, but all of the really, really important bills that were highlighted today. So thank you so much to everyone for joining. We appreciate you for being a part of Black Maternal Health Advocacy Day. Um, Renee Antoine just shared next steps. So please look out for an email that you will receive. Everyone who actually registered for the webinar will receive a follow-up email with um, some social media points to be able to share throughout uh, this afternoon and throughout the remainder of Black Maternal Health Week. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you to all the co-hosts who made this day possible. Thank you to the policymakers for being here. Thank you for our advocates who are always with us through thick and thin being here today. And thank you um, just for joining and and um, for um, being an advocate for the black for black maternal and infant health. Have a great day.